Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits and I have setbacks and updates on two sweater projects. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. So let's get started. This first tidbit came to me from Instagram. Somebody tagged me in the comments of a Franklin Habit post, which led me to a delightful afternoon of research, which I am still following. I first came across Franklin Habit years ago when he had a regular column in Knitty Magazine, where he would write about his love of 19th century knitting books and his experience knitting some of those really old patterns. So this was long before I had any interest in knitting anything from a vintage or antique pattern myself. In fact, I had zero interest in doing this myself, but I really enjoyed reading about Franklin's adventures in these Victorian knitting patterns. And it was through his articles that I first learned of Jane Gauguin, who is considered to be the mother of modern of the modern knitting pattern. Jane and her husband lived in Edinburgh, Scotland, where they had a haberdashery shop, and her husband imported various items to stock his shop, including yarn, at a time when middle-class Victorian women were taking up knitting for the first time. They wouldn't have learned it uh, as a children um, if they were in the middle class. Now, Jane realized that in order to sell more yarn, it would be really beneficial to provide knitting patterns to these new knitters. Now, she was not the first person to write knitting patterns, which at the time were called receipts. And we can see today that yarn companies continue to provide free patterns often in order to encourage um, the purchase of their particular yarn. So she wasn't the first to write knitting patterns, but she was the first to create a system of abbreviations and charting symbols, which kind of laid the groundwork for the types of patterns that we see today. Most other people writing patterns in the 19th century didn't follow her lead when it came to abbreviations and symbols. Many patterns were presented in really densely packed paragraphs of never-ending text with no white space, but her patterns were more clearly written than others and her books were incredibly popular. I'll leave a link down below to her first book uh, published in about 1840 and which has been digitized by the University of Southampton in England. They have an incredible knitting reference library of 19th century knitting books, and they've all been digitized and are all available to see on archive.org. So back to Franklin Habit. His post this past week was a photo of Jane Gauguin's grave in Scotland where he was visiting at the time. So I'll leave a link to his post so that you can see it. The photo that I'm showing here is not from his post. It's the one from Find a Grave. In his photo, he's got a picture of him holding his current work in progress um, so that it's in the frame with the obelisk. Now, the obelisk marks the resting place of Jane's daughter, but Franklin wanted to find Jane's grave, and there didn't seem to be one in the cemetery, but he confirmed with the cemetery office that Jane was actually buried in the same place where that marker was in addition to somebody else from Jane's family. Now I wondered in the comments about the wording of the inscription on that obelisk because it says that she was Jane's daughter and there's no mention of her husband at all. And Franklin commented back that according to research that Kate Davies had done, their marriage was apparently not a happy one and that they had separated by the time of their, their daughter's death. I wanted to learn more about Jane and I tracked down the, uh, the blog post that Kate Davies had written several years ago to, to find out more about Jane. And I'll link to that article below as well because it's really 
Very interesting. I always appreciate learning more about women who created business opportunities for themselves, particularly if it has if it's related to knitting. I saw in Kate Davies' footnotes a reference to a scholarly article written by Naomi Tarrant that had been published in the Journal of Scottish Genealogy back in 2016. So I'm in the process of getting my hands on that uh, copy of that journal that was uh, from the organization that published it. Um, but again, I'm gonna leave links down to everything, Franklin's Post, Kate Davies uh, article, and as well as links to the knitting reference library that's been digitized and available on archive.org. This tidbit came to me from Topher on Ravelry, and he said, not sure if you're aware of Kirsten Dirksen slash Fair Companies, but just in case, they produce videos about simple living, self-sufficiency, small and tiny homes, backyard gardens and livestock, alternative transport, DIY, craftsmanship, and philosophies of life. Uh, and there's always something interesting and educational as a viewer he says. Um, Topher then sent me a link to a video that had just been released called Alpacas Turn Decaying Farm Into Thriving Slow Fashion Homestead. And the description for the video is, years ago, Andrea Trinchieri bought a few alpaca to help mow his lawn, but soon he and his wife, Nadia Folia, had installed spinning machines at home and were selling their yarn and knitwear as a full-time job. They do it all, shearing, cleaning, carding, spinning, weaving, and even a bit of dyeing with plants. So the final product is what they call kilometer zero. Initially, it wasn't easy to find equipment for their small batch farm. Their first purchase was a carding machine from 1890. But over time, Andrea's built custom parts for the machines and even a computer-assisted wooden loom. So I will leave a link down below to this video. It's about 20 minutes long. This tidbit came from Topher as well. He's always a really good source for, for wonderful content for this tidbit section of my podcast, and I really appreciate it very much. So thank you, Topher. Um, this video is from Business Insider, and it's called Why French Lever's Lace is So Expensive. Lever's lace made in France is one of the most intricate and expensive types of lace you can buy. Thousands of individual threads are woven together on a loom that's over 100 years old, but Lever's looms aren't made today. Companies have to maintain the looms that they have. This specialized process requires an expert at every step, but that makes finding new lace makers challenging. So how is Lever's Lace made and why is it so expensive? Now, if you watch the video that I mentioned in the previous tidbit, you'll see them at one point talk about an antique jacquard loom that they bought, which uses essentially punch cards. Like they're kind of like computer punch cards. In fact, these old 19th century looms are essentially the first computers. The looms were basically like computers. The intricate designs were all programmed on cards that were read by the machine. The machines that produced Lever's Lace has a similar system uh, where there are these, the intricate designs are punched into these cards and the machine, the machine reads that, reads those. But just seeing how fine these strands are that they work with and uh, watching how they do their quality control and how they're, they mend the things that, that uh, maybe break during the process of manufacturing is really interesting. So uh, I would encourage you to watch that. And again, I'll leave a link down in the show notes. So this week I was juggling three sweater projects, my reverse engineered sweater here, which needed the button and buttonhole band, the mini sweater that I was using as a demonstration for this week's Technique Tuesday. It's this little this little guy here. <laughs> and I was also getting started on my 1970s um, sweater project for my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So my goal for my reverse engineered sweater was to come up with a buttonhole that I liked 
in the brioche button band. And then to sew the, the brioche band to the sweater so that I could actu uh, accurately time um, the starting of the buttonholes for this half of the band. So I achieved the first part of that goal. I did find a buttonhole to figure out how to do a buttonhole that I really uh, liked quite a lot and the button fit through the hole just perfectly. So yesterday I started uh, sewing the band uh, onto um, the sweater so that I could actually get the starting point right. I thought, oh, maybe I'd knit too far on the band and that I might need to rip a little uh, way back. So I was sewing it on and it looked fine as I was sewing it. I liked the way it looked. looked. And so then I put it on the dress form and what I was seeing along the edge right here was that this just kind of seemed a little uh, wavy to me. I didn't, I just didn't like the way it was when it was hanging. I took all of it out and I re-sewed it with a different ratio. So um, when it was lying down, the row gauge for the brioche and the regular knit was the same. Uh, I had used a needle two sizes smaller for the brioche, which is recommended for when you work brioche. It just ends up um, needing to be worked on smaller needles because of the, the way the stitch pattern is worked. So when the two fabrics were lying down, they both had the same row gauge. So I was sewing one row of the band to one row of the sweater. And that was when I got this kind of, I didn't like how it was rippling. So I ripped it out and I thought, well, I'll, I'll see if maybe I could should do like nine rows on the band to every 10 rows on the sweater. So I did that. And when it's lying down, it feels like, oh, it's, it's pulling up it's weirdly. And, and of course I'm having to sew it when it's lying flat. So I put it back on the dress form and I still didn't really, I still don't like the way that it, that it, seems kind of floppy. And then I realized I haven't even washed the band yet. The, most of the sweater has been washed at least once. So it has the, the final drape of that fabric, but I have not washed this brioche yet. And it's going to get more relaxed and even more drapey. So then <laughs> I also realized that typically when you are knitting a button band, and you're knitting it in say regular ribbing, you also knit that on a needle that's a couple of sizes smaller than whatever it was that you knit the sweater with so that you have something that's firmer and, and more substantial that can stand up um, to the stretching and, and all of that and uh, at, at these edges. And so I realized I probably should have gone down even more uh, needle sizes. I got fed up and I you know had to put it in a timeout <laughs> for a little bit. And I've been thinking for the past 24 hours about kind of what, what my choices are. So uh, one thing I could do is I could try doing some swatching on a needle four sizes smaller than the needle I used for this and then washing it and seeing what I think of the fabric. Uh, the problem I'm going to have by going down smaller is that the buttonhole that I figured out how to work is going to end up being too small. So then I'd have to figure out another buttonhole. And so I'm, I'm about ready to throw the towel in on the brioche. So it was something I'd never knit on a sweater before. And I was interested in trying because the commercially knit sweater that this is designed from had it and I thought well that's interesting that would be something interesting to try and I'm always wanting to learn uh, new things but I'm at the point in this sweater where I'm done uh, learning from my mistakes <laughs> and I on this sweater I want to learn mistakes on all new projects. I think what I'm going to do is just give up on the brioche and I'm going to knit a, a regular old ribbed button band. I could do knit one pearl one ribbing instead and, and keep it this vertical way or I could uh, keep uh, keep with the uh, the ribbing that's that's everywhere else in the sweater, which is a knit two purl two ribbing, and knit it perpendicularly instead. So I don't really want a knit two purl two ribbing going this way. It, it doesn't work very well. But you can certainly do a, a perpendicularly. And for knit one purl one, I uh, I would be willing to do that vertically. 
Uh, and, and then it would look more like what this brioche looks like. I, I just feel like I'm more comfortable with being able to control the outcome if I use a, one of those ribbing options versus the other. And it leaves me open to all sorts of buttonhole choices um, that are very easy for me to execute regardless of which direction the buttonhole is going and uh, which direction uh, the button band is going. I'm kind of tempted to do the Knit 2 Pearl 2 perpendicularly just because then it, it will match all of the other ribbing. Uh, so I'll probably take the next day or two to swatch and, um, and attach and, and see what I think of the results. Last week, I was telling you guys I had this idea for the buttons and showed you the two colors of buttons that uh, that I'm using for the sweater which are these two right here and some of you notice that they're not the same sizes and you many of you guessed correctly what I'm doing for the buttons so let's see if I can get a good picture of it here. I'll put it I'll put in a close-up picture but I am stacking the buttons so that there is the larger red button is on the bottom and the smaller black is on the top, top and it gives kind of that little rim of, of red which calls back to what I'm doing at the top of the pockets here in terms of, of having the, the little bit of red there. I still have to weave in the ends and tuck in the, the I-cord ends of the pocket as well and weave in all the other yarn tails. That's the setback on this particular sweater. I am uh, ready to be finished with it so I think I, uh, I'm just going to go ahead with some type of ribbing and, um, and then I'll be done with it. The other project that I have been working on this week has been my 1970s sweater, the sweater that's part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So I've been excited to get going on this sweater just because it's new, I'm always excited. And so I wanna go to the overhead and kind of show you what progress I've made. I made quite a lot of progress, which is one reason <laughs> my reverse engineered sweater is still kind of dragging along. So I want to go to the overhead and show you a modification I made to my original design that I showed you last week. Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the resources that I'm using and the context that I, I'm gaining about some of the resources that were available to knitters in the 1970s. I've talked a lot about Elizabeth Zimmerman and Barbara Walker in the 1970s and how influential they are. One of the goals of this project is to really get an understanding of the evolution of the hand knit sweater and understanding what construction methods were used, how those evolved, the techniques that were used, and to kind of pinpoint where certain things really changed and if I could figure out what influenced those changes. And I've known all along that Barbara Walker and Elizabeth Zimmerman had a profound effect on how we knit today and that their work uh, was established in the 1970s. Uh, but even as I've known that, I have been kind of putting uh, the puzzle pieces together when I actually looked at the chronology of not just each of their books, but their books in combination with each other. And as I mentioned, they've had a profound effect on designers still 50 years later. So I'm going to talk about uh, another book that uh, was influenced by Elizabeth Zimmerman that um, that I just found out from one of my viewers a couple of weeks ago. So let's go to the overhead and I'll show you everything that I've been working on this week. Last week I was showing you this little layout of the sweater that I was designing and I was explaining about the vertical symmetry that I wanted. So I wanted to start with a, a diamond and I wanted to end with a diamond and uh, how I laid it all out. So I definitely wanted to start and end with a diamond and because the diamond is like three inches long, uh, I you know, was flexible with how long I wanted the sweater to be in total once it was finished. So I chose six diamonds. It was gonna give me a sweater that was a little on the shorter side of what I like, but I was gonna be okay with it uh, with six diamonds. I started uh, knitting the sweater 
I'll show you what I have done so far. Um, actually, I have about three and a half diamonds done so far. Uh, and I was a part of the way up and I was measuring what I had just to confirm my row gauge. And I will absolutely confirm it again before I get to the underarm um, to make sure that th the length is going to be right. Because what's important is that I end at the, a diamond and that I have an armhole that's the correct depth. So um, when it comes to uh, where I start this armhole, it doesn't have to be at the top of a diamond. It could be up or down a little bit. What's important is that I end at a diamond and that the armhole is the depth that I want. So I do this routinely with sweaters. I will wash them when I get to the underarm just to confirm that my row gauge is correct and that going forward before I start doing the shaping that everything is going to work out correctly. So I was knitting along and I was measuring my row gauge and I thought, or I was measuring the actual length and I thought, geez, this is a little shorter than what I was expecting. And so I looked back at my original swatch and then I realized what my mistake was when I calculated my, my row gauge. So the way that these diamonds work, you start with three stockinette stitches and then it's surrounded by reverse stockinette here and then the diamond gets wider and then it gets narrower and the 24th row has five knit stitches, stockinette stitches going across. And it isn't until you start the next diamond that you're back to having the three uh, stockinette stitches. So when you want this kind of vertical symmetry, you will work, you know, full repeats of the diamond, and then you will work the first two rows of the repeat one last time in order to achieve that perfect symmetry. What I had done in my swatch was I had knit one complete diamond with the perfect symmetry. And so when I measured how long this was, I was thinking that I was measuring 24 rows, not that I was measuring 26 rows. So my row gauge was off. And that meant that will accumulate uh, over time, over the course of, of the entire sweater, that's going to add up to, you know, a couple of inches um, difference in the length of the sweater. So because I have a few inches of leeway and because the sweater was already going to be on the short side, I looked at how long it would be if I had seven diamonds and I had the correct row gauge <laughs> calculated. So uh, with seven diamonds, this works out perfectly. I just need to basically add one more diamond to the body and then everything is going to be completely fine. So knowing that I'm going to have seven uh, diamonds in the body instead of six and seeing how far along I currently am now in this project. I, my spreadsheet that I did to calculate the total number of stitches says that the sweater is going to have just under 50,000 stitches, I think about 49,000. And I am about 40% of the way already just with these three and a half uh, diamonds because the body is the largest circumference. Uh, as I go further up, the body will get narrower and the sleeves are smaller in circumference and then there's the neck hole. So uh, the majority of the sweater, you know, is is down in this body. My enthusiasm for starting a new project has, has gotten me already at 40% for the sweater. So assuming, ha ha, nothing goes wrong, um, this should be actually a fairly quick uh, sweater to knit. So let's keep our fingers crossed that nothing goes wrong. Just to remind you, if you don't know, I'm designing the sweater using this book by Elizabeth Zimmerman called Knitting Without Tears. It's the kangaroo pouch sweater. For the stitch patterns, I am using Barbara Walker's Second Treasury of Knitting Patterns. That was published in 1970. So these are both very early 1970s. Uh, publications. The thing about the stitch patterns in Barbara Walker's treasuries, uh, and which was true for many stitch patterns for decades after this time period, is that they are all written assuming that you are knitting flat. So if you want to knit in the round, which is what I'm doing for this sweater, you have to convert these flat instructions to instructions that will work in the round. Well, that was fairly easy. Um, for this stitch pattern because 
you have two rows in a row that are identical. You establish the stitch pattern for one row on the right side, and then on the wrong side row, you'd knit your knits and purl your purls. So in order to translate that into knitting in the round, again, you knit your knits and purl your purls. You don't always know that just by reading the instructions. So you do need to do some conversion. And oftentimes with flat knitting patterns, there is horizontal symmetry where you have extra stitches on each edge, which you would want to eliminate if you were knitting in the round. So there, there are various issues that go into converting these patterns. I did a series on converting flat knitting patterns to patterns that can be worked in the round last December. I'll, lit, I'll uh, link to the playlist up here and then down below. So I always chart out the stitch patterns no matter what because I just like being able to see uh, what I'm doing. What I think is interesting though is that the next book that Barbara Walker came out with was knitting from the top. And in this book, she was doing a lot of seamless knitting, a lot of knitting in the round. So she's got all these stitch dictionaries that are for flat knitting, and now she's got this book for knitting from the top. So what did she publish after this book? Charted Knitting Designs, A Third Treasury of Knitting Patterns. And this is the book, she did all of this in, you know, on graph paper with you know pens and, and pencils. But she came up with a system of symbols. Many of the symbols were already in use in European patterns, but she came up with quite a few that are for cables that we still use today. This is what's fascinating to me is looking at the progression of her books in the 19, late 60s and then into the 70s, uh, what she did and, and how useful they are uh, when designing a sweater from the 1970s. Uh, so uh, I thought that was really uh, interesting to kind of put those pieces together about what was going on with Barbara Walker's books. Um, but both, uh, both the Knitting from the Top and Knitting Without Tears were really the, the first books that, knit, that knitters had um, for designing their own sweaters. The work of these two women has continued to influence designers 50 years later, but not without having evolved in one way or another. So both of these books can be a challenge for people who are trying to knit something themselves because they are written in just paragraph form and they're just explaining how to do things. Uh, for some people, I know for me, I really need to look at things in, in more of a diagram or chart uh, layout. And so it's more, it can be more of a challenge for me to read through there and find the information that I'm looking for because it might be buried in a paragraph. Somebody mentioned in the comments a few weeks ago this book, which was, the this is the second edition. It was published in the early 2000s, I think maybe 2004. It's by Jacqueline Fee. And her the first edition was published in around 1984. She had come across Elizabeth Zimmerman's book, Knitting Without Tears, in the early 70s and was so grateful for it because there literally had been nothing for knitters that explained things the way that Knitting Without Tears did. And she wrote to Elizabeth Zimmerman thanking her for that and then got a postcard in response telling her about Elizabeth's summer sweater camp that she held in Wisconsin every year. And so she went to, Jacqueline, who wrote this book, went to the camp and kind of uh, learned everything she could from Elizabeth Zimmerman over the years. And she, in turn, developed Elizabeth's system, this percentage system and her the process for knitting and designing sweaters. She developed it and was teaching it to other uh, knitters as well. And she got Elizabeth's uh, blessing um, to publish this particular book. So. If you like the idea of Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's percentage system, but don't want to rely strictly on the book that was published in 1971 and might actually want some more resources, um, this is actually quite a good book. I don't know that you can buy it new. I bought it used and it's practically, it's in a very good condition. It wasn't very expensive at all. One of the things that I really like about this book is that she, talks about knitting a sweater sampler so that you have a sampler that includes all different kinds of ribbings, includes doing things like stripes in ribbing, uh, an afterthought pocket, different types of increases and decreases, um, some stranded color work, some edgings, all kinds of things. And then you can use this as a resource for when you are designing uh, sweaters. 
but she's got color photographs and she's got a lot more, uh, uh, she lays out the process um, a little bit differently. She, uh, like me, does not have a prejudice <laughs> against uh, the purl stitch like Elizabeth Zimmerman did. She is more willing to knit things uh, flat, but still seamlessly, rather than using steaks in some circumstances. So this is a newer book. It's got a lot more information in it, but it's still built on Elizabeth Zimmerman's work. So if that's something that you have been wanting to do, kind of dip your toes into the uh, Elizabeth's percentage system, um, this might be something. You can get this used. I got mine off a books. I'll leave the name of the book down below and I'll see if I can find the link to somewhere where you might be able to find a used copy. Well that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.